Thank you for tuning in to Grace Presbyterian Church in Franklin, North Carolina, our what has become a weekly event, recording worship services. Today we are doing something a little bit different, much more scaled back and low key. And we hope that it will bless your heart and that the Lord will be exalted in our time together. Just to let you know, the worship guide, once again, is linked in the description of the YouTube video down below. You can click that link and you can download it from Google Docs. Also, uh, if the Lord leads you to make a contribution to the church, you can mail it to us here at 361st Street in Franklin, North Carolina, 28734. Or you can drop it in our mailbox outside. It's secured. It's locked. So if you'd like to make that contribution, we don't feel like uh, you, we don't want you to feel like you have to do that. But if you'd like to, we would appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we hope you enjoy today's message.
As always, if you would like for us to be praying for you, if you have particular prayer requests, we would love to receive those. You can mail those directly to me at pastor.tobypope at gmail.com, pastor.tobypope at gmail.com, and I will pass those on and we'll get those in our prayer list and we'll be glad to pray for you. And if you'd like uh, prayers for you or for uh, someone you know, uh, please let us know about those. We'd appreciate the opportunity to pray for you. Well, let's go to the Lord. Uh, let's take our desires, our burdens, our cares, and our anxieties to Him because He cares for us so much. Let's go to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to You for the way in which You do care for us. Thank You that before the earth was formed, before anything happened in the universe, Lord, You have set Your love upon us and you love us so deeply, and you have called us to yourself. You have drawn us into your family. You have given us your spirit, and you have blessed us with the opportunity to bring our cares and our concerns to you because you care for us. Thank you that we don't have to wait in line to come before you, and there is no distance between us and you. And we thank you for the way that we can come right to you, just as you came right to us. You sent your son to be born of woman. Thank you for Jesus in this Easter season. We praise you for his sinless life and his sacrificial death for sinners like us. Thank you that by His blood we are cleansed of our sin. We are brought near to the Father. We are given the Holy Spirit so that there is no distance between us and you. We praise you for that. Thank you for the security that that gives to us to be able to rest in your love. And yet, Lord, we also recognize that there is a lot of insecurity around us and, and we feel that. We feel these insecurities during this time of transition. We recognize that so many of us, we either have what we don't want or we don't want what we do have. For many, this has been a time of loss, a loss of responsibility, a loss of position, a loss of a job, loss of financial stability. And we lift them up to you, Lord. We pray that you would help them in this time of loss. And we grieve along with them. We are sorry for the ways in which this particular time has led to a these losses. And we pray, Lord, that for those of us who have received the comfort of Christ, Lord, give us opportunities to comfort others, to help them as we are able. Please bring them across our paths and bring them to our minds and put them upon our hearts so that we would reach out to them and supply their needs as we are able. For others, Lord, it's on the one hand, a time of loss, but it's also a time of gain, a time where they have gained new responsibilities, perhaps in the home. Mothers and fathers who are no longer going to work, but are facing difficulties providing for their children. They are seeking to homeschool them when they never asked for the opportunity to homeschool. They are looking at all sorts of added burdens, not just things taken away, but things added to them. And so, Lord, would you help them? And would you help us as a community to help them? We lift them up to you, Lord, and we ask that you would, out of your abundance and out of your gracious will and your abundant mercy, 
would you meet them in their need? And would you help us to help them as we are able and as we have the opportunity? May we be open-handed toward those who are in such need today. Finally, Lord, we want to pray for the end of this particular trial. Lord, a trial that has led to all sorts of other trials. We pray, Lord, for the doctors and for the companies that are investigating a cure and a vaccine for COVID-19. We ask, Lord, that you would grant them success. We pray, Lord, that that success would be soon, that it would be a real success, not just a seeming success, but a real success so that people might be healed, so that people would have the medication and the treatment that they need to not become ill. Lord, we not only pray for this right now, but we also pray for it as many are talking about the ongoing ramifications of this next winter, next spring. We pray that it would not be an annual occurrence. We don't really want to think about that right now. But in the midst of this, Lord, we entrust it to you, trusting in your sovereign and fatherly care for us. Thank you for your graciousness toward us. We pray that you'd be near those who are in need today. Be near to those who are brokenhearted. Be near to those who are crushed in spirit. And would you lift them up and would you comfort and counsel them by your grace for your glory and for their good. We ask all these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The last time we were in Mark's gospel, we were looking at some of the different characters. We looked at the apostles and we looked at Judas and we looked at Jesus and the chief priests and the Jewish leadership as examples of what Jesus preached on back in Mark chapter 4 about the different types of soil and the good seed and the types of soil that that seed fell on. Today we've got some more characters who are coming into the drama as we enter Mark chapter 15. This is taking place on the Friday of Holy Week, first thing in the morning before Jesus' crucifixion. We have the Jewish leadership still, but we have a couple of other characters who enter in. We find Barabbas, and we also find Pilate as well. So today we're not going to use that parable of the seeds and soil as we did before, but we are going to look at the different characters involved and see what we can learn from them and how Jesus addresses us in our own particular situation today and how the cross and Jesus' crucifixion addresses our problems and how the Holy Spirit helps us to overcome the sorts of issues that we find uh, here in the text today. So we are going to be reading from Mark chapter 15. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 15. And if you have a copy of God's Word handy, I'd encourage you to open that up. There's also the sermon handout linked in the description down there if you'd like to follow along with the major points that I'm making And there's some follow-up questions as well if you'd like to investigate those individually or with your family or uh, perhaps others who are gathered around or perhaps through social media. You'd be welcome to do that. They're there for your blessing. Mark chapter 15 is where we are. We're reading verses 1 through 15. Let's turn to God's Word. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now, at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. 
And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is God's word for God's people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this, your word. Uh, we thank you for the way in which this particular section testifies to you, for your spotless righteousness. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you did for us, all that you are doing, and all that you promise yet to do for us as we trust in you today. We lift these prayers, trusting in you to enlighten our eyes and to open our minds and hearts to receive this, your word, for our blessing and for your glory. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So once again, here in the text, we find these different characters. The chief priests hold a consultation with the elders, with the scribes, the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away to Pilate. The reason they did that was because they couldn't themselves put Jesus to death. This was capital punishment, and they couldn't carry it out themselves. That had to be carried out by the Romans, and so they had to get Pilate involved somehow. And the way that they do that is to take Jesus to Pilate, and they accuse him of many things. As we see here in the text, however, Pilate is not really convinced that there's any case against Jesus. Pilate is convinced of Jesus' innocence. As we find in other accounts from the Gospels, Pilate washes his hands of the matter. He doesn't want anything to do with it, but yet he's pressured by the crowds. The crowds, in turn, are doing what the scribes and chief priests wanted them to do, and so it seems to me that what's going on here is that there is this chain of effects, these causes and effects leading to Jesus' crucifixion, I think, are worthy of our consideration. Now, let us consider what these different characters are doing. At the end of the passage, we find Pilate. So we're going to be kind of working a little bit backwards here. At the end of the passage, we find Pilate, verse 15. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd. Now, Pilate, as you probably know, is the local Roman governor. He is accountable to Caesar, and he is responsible for carrying out justice in this particular situation. We find, however, that he's not as interested in justice as he is in satisfying the crowd. The crowd are putting the pressure on Pilate. They're turning up the heat so that Pilate will do what they want him to do. Pilate acquiesces to the crowd's desires. Pilate wants to avoid a riot. He wants to avoid unrest and feels like it's better to appease the crowd than to deal with the injustice which is being perpetrated here upon the Christ. That's Pilate. Next up, we have the crowds. The crowd is introduced here. We find the crowd being uh, referenced in verse 11. Again, in verse 13, verse 14, and verse 15. The crowd is playing a role in this. Now, who is this crowd? That's a question that ought to be answered. 
This crowd would be Jews from Jerusalem who are seeking to honor and respect the, the chief priests and the Jewish leadership. This would be a different crowd than the Galilean crowd that welcomed Jesus a few days before. That crowd that was shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save. That's a different crowd than we find here in the text before us today. This crowd is all too willing to see Jesus crucified. But what's driving this crowd? Again, we find another link in the chain. Verse 11, the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. So the crowd is being stirred up by the chief priests. The Jewish leadership is inciting them to do what is surely unlawful to convict and to execute a law-abiding man, one who is indeed perfectly righteous, but who everybody admits has done nothing wrong. As we saw back in chapter 14, even the false witnesses, they couldn't have even agree among themselves as to something that Jesus had done wrong. And so this crowd is in no way interested in righteousness. They're in no way interested in the cause of truth. They are being stirred up by the Jewish leadership. This Jewish leadership is, of course, in a very sad predicament. We find that they have completely thrown any semblance of right, any semblance of well-doing, any semblance of abiding by their own law. They've completely chucked it so that they can do what they want to do to Jesus. We found this first back in Mark chapter 3, where they are already planning to put Jesus to death. That was two years earlier, but they've not had an opportunity to do so. And now that Jesus is on their home ground, on their own turf, so to speak, now the Jewish leadership has their big opportunity to put Jesus to death. But they need the crowd backing them up. They had feared the crowds back the end of uh, chapter 13 and 14. We found the crowd was a fan of Jesus. And indeed, back in chapter 11, we found a certain telling instance of the way in which the, the Jerusalem leadership was fearful of the crowd. It wouldn't do certain things to Jesus because they feared the crowd. Now, what did we find back there in chapter 11? Back there in chapter 11, it said this, all the crowd was astonished at Jesus' teaching. Recall that teaching was the primary ministry of these Jewish leadership. They were called to not only abide by the Jewish law, but called to interpret it. And they were widely regarded as the teachers of Israel. But now the crowd has become astonished at a different teacher, one who is outside of their order, one who is outside of their own group. And so it is telling what Pilate mentions here about these chief priests. Why did they deliver Jesus over? What was driving them? The crowd was driving Pilate. The chief priests were driving the crowd. But what was driving the chief priests? Pilate said in verse 10, he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. And so envy is driving the chief priests chief priest driving the crowd, crowd driving Pilate. Envy is what is behind all of this crucifixion, all of this desire to put Jesus to death. It is envy. This is a very difficult, difficult thing for us to understand. And indeed, if it weren't written here in Scripture, it would be hard for us to believe that these people who have sworn to abide by the law, who have sworn to walk in its ways, have completely chucked it now and have thrown every 
ounce of their weight behind getting Jesus crucified. And so the crowd here is desiring to put Jesus to death. The chief priests want to put Jesus to death. And this is the situation. It's all driven by this, what's what we usually say, the big green monster, envy. Envy is driving the situation. Well, how do we understand this text and what are we to do with it? How does this apply to us? Well, certainly we want to recognize that Jesus is being crucified here because of wicked men. And they are working not only their own will, but underneath that will, they are working under the divine sovereign hand of God. And this is God's will that Jesus would go to the cross as a substitute, which brings us to the last uh, character in our text today. We find Barabbas. Now, this Barabbas, we find biographical details here in verse 7. Mark says, he was among the rebels in prison. He had committed murder in the insurrection. So we find this man who is a rebel. He is uh, arisen against the Roman local authority there. This insurrection that he led, that would be a violation of the fifth commandment. Murder, violation of the sixth commandment. And I'm sure there are other violations in there as well. And it's this man who goes free. It is Barabbas who goes free. But innocent Jesus, righteous Jesus, is the one who goes to the cross. Now, this is, I think, at least meant to remind us of this principle of substitution, that the guilty man goes free and the innocent one is punished. This is the principle of substitution. God's righteous son, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How is he going to take away the sin of the world? Well, it was by bearing our sins on his shoulders. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was crushed for our transgressions. Upon him was the chastisement that we deserved. He went to the cross for others, not for himself. He went to the cross for sinners. Now, we have no idea if Barabbas ever converted or not. We don't know that. We do know that certain chief priests, certain ones of the Jewish leadership did convert, as we'll see later on in chapter 15. We find Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus assisting in the burial of Jesus. So certain ones did convert. This principle of substitution is certainly one of the lessons that we learn from this text, that the guilty go free and the innocent suffers. He's not suffering for his own sin. He's suffering for our sins. That is the glory of this gospel that we preach and that we celebrate, that Christ went to the cross for us, and by his stripes we are healed. By his suffering, by his substitution, our death sentence, our guilt is removed, and we are free to follow Christ. And that makes all the difference for we must first admit that we indeed are sinners. We also recognize that being forgiven, we also need help. So how does God change people like us, people who trust in him for their salvation? How does God change people who struggle with the same sorts of things that these folks were struggling with, the crowd who is struggling with whether to honor their leaders or not, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders who were so bent on satisfying their envy that their principles had just flown out the window. Well, we struggle with many of the same things. We struggle with envy. We struggle with following leadership that perhaps ought not 
to be followed, we recognize our need for help. We have been set free to follow Christ, to love his word, and to be empowered to do both by his Holy Spirit. And this is the liberation for us from our envious tendencies, from our desires to one-up other people. He went to the cross, Jesus did, to eradicate not just our envy, but the seeds of envy. Now, where does envy come from? Envy comes from our desire and our endless making of comparisons, sadly enough. You and I were made in the image of God. We were made by him, and God wasn't threatened by making such image bearers. He was delighted by it, but there's often such a discontent in our hearts to simply being loved and cherished, even prized by God. It's not enough to be prized. We want to be more prized or most prized, more loved, most loved. We have this innate uh, sinful tendency. It doesn't come from the image of God. It comes from our having broken God's law. We have this tendency to make comparisons. You see it not just in adults, you see it in children jockeying for the affection of mom or dad. When they hear that they're loved, they want to be more loved. They want to be most loved. Mom loves me more. I'm her favorite. Like the rest of us, they go looking for people to give them what only God can. I want to be the apple of his eye. I want to be the only apple of his eye. Most cherished, most loved, most prized. As we come to know the love of God, we recognize the death of our envy and the end of our desire, our need to make comparisons as we begin to rest in the love of God. Rest in his love and that rest in his love enables us not only to delight in the gifts that he's given to us, but to delight in the gifts that he gives to others. And we can genuinely rejoice when he does good to other people. And only resting in the love of God can give us the rest that we need and the rest that we long for. Now, this is particularly apparent to me in our own moment right now. You see, we are perhaps home more than we have been before. We're on social media more. We are looking not only at ourselves, we're looking at our own children, we're looking at our parents, we're looking at our city, our nation, we're looking at the whole world. And there is this struggle, this struggle with envy, this struggle with making comparisons. It happens to all of us as a pastor. I am on social media sometimes on Facebook, and I see these posts from other pastors and them talking about all the different things that they've been able to do since they've been under stay-at-home orders, the books that they've been able to read and the people they've been able to make contact with and all the different ways in which they've been able to carry out conferencing and, and all these accomplishments that they've got. And there's a sense in me, a sense in my heart, I ought to be doing more. See, I'm making comparisons between myself and other pastors. When the very nature of Facebook and social media is to realize, is, is to say, you know what, I don't know the whole picture. You get a snapshot. And we tend to universalize that and say, well, that must be the whole picture of their lives. And we don't, we don't understand it. It's not just true for pastors. I'm sure it's true for mothers and for fathers, for workers and other folks as well. For mothers thinking, okay, I'm, I'm supposed to be a homeschooler now. How am I going to homeschool my children? I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Why can't I be like that other mom who's always doing the fun activities and teaching her children how to use ham radios or how to use uh, the convection oven or whatever it might be? Uh, they're 
showing their children, hey, we learned a foreign language this week. I don't know. There are all these sorts of things that we may be prompted to feel like I'm not enough. I don't measure up. Or to be making comparisons all the time. Well, I, I did that better. May, maybe I'm uh, so gifted at being a homeschooling mom and I could do something else. So there is this tendency to make comparisons that's particularly uh, harmful right now in this particular time. So what do we do? How do we address that? How do we address our own hearts in this? Well, we remember the love of God that rests upon us because Jesus has died for us, because Jesus has risen, because Jesus has sent his spirit. We can rest in the love of God. Now, how does this work? Well, the first way in which this works is that the love of God enables us to rest because it never changes. See, God's love doesn't fluctuate with our obedience or disobedience. The love of God is perfect. The love of God is unchanging. I love that line in a Michael Card song. He cannot love more and will not love less. We have been loved completely by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We can rest in that because it doesn't change. It does not change. The second way in which the love of God gives us rest is that he knows us completely. There's not something hidden from him. It's not like, oh, well, I didn't know what was in your closet. God's not saying that. He knows every single, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And because of that, we can rest. We are enabled to have such a great joy because we know, you know what? I'm not going to tell God something he doesn't know. I'm not going to surprise him. Oh, well, I wouldn't have loved you if I had known that. God doesn't do that. His love never changes, and it doesn't rest upon his ignorance. It doesn't rest upon him not knowing something about us. He knows us completely and loves us completely. Thirdly, the love of God gives us rest because it comes apart from our deserving. See, none of us deserve the love of God. We all deserve the wrath of God. Every single one of us deserved to be on that cross, just like Barabbas deserved to be on that cross and Jesus deserved to be liberated. We all deserve the wrath of God. That is what you and I have earned by our own disobedience, our sins of omission, our sins of commission. We have earned the wrath of God. But glory to God, we are not treated as our sins deserve. God's love comes to us, not just apart from our deserving, but even in spite of our deserving. We don't deserve it, and we never could. Everyone deserves it zero. There's not one person in this world that deserves the love of God more than you do or less than you do. We all deserve it zero. And then finally, the love of God gives rest because he's the source of all our gifts. Every gift that we have comes from him. Every ability that we have comes from him. And that's what makes us special. We're made special by God, who knit us together in our mother's womb. He gave us the brains that we have, the heart that we have, the hands that we have, the talents, the gifts. All these come from God. And that's what makes us special. So that doesn't mean that I'm more special than anybody else or less special than anybody else. I am simply special. And I don't have to compare. Now that works in a couple of different ways. On the one hand, we don't have to be ashamed of our gifts. When someone compliments you, when you share your gifts, whether it's cooking or compassion or music or whatever it might be, when someone compliments you, you can say, thank you. But so often our tendency is to say, well, it was nothing. Well, God doesn't give a gift called nothing. He gives you specifically the gifts that you do have. And therefore, you can just say thank you to the gifts that you are able to exercise. You don't have to be ashamed of your gifts. Neither do you 
should you be proud of your gifts as well? So when someone compliments you, don't say, well, I could have done better than that. And the reason is because you don't want somebody to think, oh, well, apparently they're a lot better than, <laughs> than I thought they were. We don't want to give that impression. Well, I'm really much better than you think I am. That's not the goal either. We don't want to be ashamed of our gifts. We don't want to be proud of our gifts. We're just thankful for the gifts. And we exercise them in the ways in which God leads us to do. Let me close with an illustration. Uh, you have hopefully seen the movie Chariots of Fire. Uh, Chariots of Fire was a great movie uh, back in the early 80s. Still is a great movie. It's weathered time. And I'm thankful for uh, the way in which it tells the story of two men. One, Eric Liddell, and secondly, Harold Abrahams. Both men are very, very fast. They are both on the Olympic team in 1924 uh, from the United Kingdom. But they have very different motivations. On the one hand, you may be familiar with Harold Abrahams. Now, apart from whether this was uh, completely true or whether they took some artistic license, I'm not sure. But in the movie, Harold Abrahams was doing it to prove something because he was Jewish and you re recognize that anti-Semitism was, was ripe uh, all throughout this time, uh, all over uh, many places around the world. And Harold Abrahams was running to prove something. He was running to prove that Jews were not less than. And so that was his motivation, was to prove something. He couldn't simply rejoice in being fast. He was driven to be faster, fastest. That was his motivation. He was trying to overcome prejudice against the Jews through personal success. And his life couldn't continue apart from that personal success. It became very, very difficult for him. And he simply had to beat other people to feel like he was successful. He had to be better, best. On the other hand, you have Eric Liddell, who had that most famous line, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. His motivation was simply to feel God's pleasure. He wanted to know that God's face was shining upon him. He knew that God's face was shining upon him. He could rejoice in his gift, simply running fast. It was a gift that God had given to him, and he could rest in that. He could be happy in that, and so he didn't have to be best. That's why he could refuse to run on a Sunday, because it wasn't about him being the best. It was about him simply using the gifts that God had given to him and enjoying those gifts. So he said, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Not when I run, I'm glad that I'm beating other people. Or when I run, I can get a gold medal. Or when I run, I'm glad that I'm faster than the other guy. No. When I run, I feel God's pleasure. He could rejoice in his gifts and, and leave that those seeds of comparison making behind, those seeds of envy which so often drive our behaviors and our choices. And for us, God delights it when we use our gifts as well. God delights in not in us comparing ourselves with others. That's not the reason he gave us our gifts in the first place. He gave them to us for us to enjoy and for others to enjoy. And so we can rejoice in other people using their gifts. And we hope that they'll enjoy when we use our gifts. And that makes God happy. It brings him great joy when his people use the gifts and gratitude. And it brings us joy as well. And so as we consider what Jesus is teaching us here in this particular passage, we can be letting go of this desire for making comparisons. We can be letting go of our desire to be better or best. And we can simply rejoice in the gifts that God has given to us. 
rejoicing in Him. God can give you that joy. He can give you that delight. And if you delight in receiving the Father's love through Christ, if you delight in the Father's unfathomable love for you, making you in His image, redeeming you, cherishing you, He loves you so very much. You can be sure that His blessing rests upon you today. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for taking our sins to the cross. And thank you for the joy that you put in our hearts because we can rest in the Father's love. We can rest in your love. Thank you, Father, for loving us with an everlasting love, love that never changes and never gives up. Thank you, Jesus, for the way in which you show us the love, and thank you, Holy Spirit, for anchoring that love in our hearts and reminding us of it moment by moment and day by day. So help us to rest today and always in the love of God and rejoice in the opportunities that you send in our way so that we can be a blessing to others as they are to us. So help us to love each other well. Help us to fight against the temptations that we all face day by day to to make comparisons and to be dissatisfied with what you've done and who you are. Forgive us for the ways in which we've done that and lead us in the way everlasting. And we ask all these prayers in the name of Jesus, trusting in him. Amen. Out of our gratitude to the Lord uh, for the grace that he's shown to us, the love that we have, and the love that we rest in, let us go to him now in prayer. Lord Jesus, we do thank you and praise you for your love for us. Almighty Father, uh, thank you for the love that you have shown to us. Thank you for making us in your image. Thank you for keeping covenant with us, even though uh, we had broken it. Lord, you have restored it through Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord, that you are the sign and seal of that new covenant. And we are now bound to Christ. We are united to him by faith. We praise you and thank you for the rest that we have because of these precious and very great truths. We ask, Lord, that you would guard us from envy and guard us from that tendency to make comparisons as we have so many opportunities. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for our sins and help us, Lord, to rest in Christ and to rest in that love that we have because of his finished work. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace to us. Thank you for all the ways in which you're at work. And we praise you for this particular time together. We love you and we thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name that we lift all these prayers. Amen. Amen. If you're resting in the love of God today, if you are trusting in Jesus' sacrifice for your sins and looking to Him today and resting in Him, I offer you this blessing now from His Word in His name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forever. Amen and amen.